Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Leathercraft Community Podcast Show. I'm sitting with a wonderful guest today that I am so excited to introduce you guys to. He has been working in the leathercraft industry for 72 years and is a wealth of knowledge. So with that being said, I am so excited for you guys to hear the story of Rocky Minster. Rocky, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I want to dive right on in, Rocky, because you have decades of experience. Can you tell us, how did you get started in leathercraft and, uh, and, and in saddle making? Well, for me, the first things that I can remember as a small child, my dad being a cowboy, was horses, cowboys, and saddle shops. And my dad loved handmade boots and rode nothing but custom-made saddles, and he knew a lot of saddle makers. And in Southern California, when I was growing up, there were quite a few saddle shops in the San Fernando Valley, and I used to go in and while he was visiting, I would gravitate back to the shop and watch the men working. So it was just one of those things that always fascinated me. And uh, I just continued on without, without a natural plan in that. So. Did you know that there are, I live in the San Fernando Valley now, and there's no saddle shops there. There's no. zero. There's not one. And there's not even a silversmith shop either or no. boot making shop. There were there were I think six saddle shops. I know of two boot makers, I believe there were four, and there were probably a half a dozen silversmiths. Of uh, alfalfa fields, citrus, white fences, horses and cattle, roping arenas and boarding stables. It was real cowboy country and there were a lot of cowboys working there that were working in the movies. And being cowboys, they rode handmade equipment. So I got to know some of those fellas too when I was small. Awesome. And now, did you train or apprentice under a saddle maker? I did. I did. I uh, I started. I st we were living in here in Arizona in a saddle shop in Prescott. We'd go to town once a month, and I would end up at the saddle shop. And uh, it was Frank Eberly, who was a well known stamper and maker of stamping tools took a liking to me and started showing me and I bought my first tools from him when I was 12 years old and I started stamping on leather and he liked me and he'd give me scraps of leather which <laughs> I'd take home and I would work on them and I'd take them into him and he would give me pointers of what to do. Yeah. Do you still have some of those tools? I still use some, and then I also I also made some in the sh in the shop at the ranch, and I'm still using still using two of those tools that I made when I was like 12, 13 years old. I still use. And how long was your apprenticeship uh, under that settlement? Well, it was it was supposed to be a five year apprenticeship, but knowing he was not going to take me all the way through, he was going to be working for about two years, and. Uh, uh, then he would pass me on to some other people, and that's how it, that's kind of how it went. One of the things about it was that does not happen today. When I graduated from high school, my dad said, "Okay, Rocky, what your mother and I have taught you, what you should learn in school, you're ready to go on your own. So you have two weeks grace to decide what you want to do." You either make a deal with your mom for room and board and find a job in town, or find a job that provides room and board, which meant go cowboying, which he didn't want me to really do because he kept telling me not to do that. And I couldn't find a job. Uh, the ranches, uh, the small ones were over with their work, and the big ranches, the wagons were out. Nobody had been hurt, and so there was no jobs for a young person. And I was trying to figure out what to do. And on a Saturday, as Frank came out, just came driving up and said, Rocky, how would you like to go to work for me as an apprentice? And that was the job. And so I said, yeah, because I, I enjoyed doing that. And after working with him for almost two years, his wife died and he retired. I went to another saddle maker, worked for him for a year. Then I went to the valley and I worked in some saddle shops in the, down in the valley in the Phoenix area. And after, after four going on five years, I finally built my first saddle from start to finish. But I've been being paid to work in a shop. Gotcha. And how old were you when you made when you made that first saddle? 
I just turned, tw- I was 20 years old wow. when I made my first one. Do you know where it's at or do you still have it? Uh, <clears throat> no. Uh, I sold it to a fella in Yuma, Arizona, and because uh, I needed the money. And uh, he called me, that would have been in 1959, 1960, the winter there. And he called me when I had my business about 1975 and said he was had still been riding the saddle and it was stolen. And would I write out a replacement for him to turn into his insurance company? Wow. And so I don't know what happened yet. Oh, man. Well, you sounds like you've had multiple saddle shop experiences. Can you describe what's the from your time now versus the current state of saddle shops? What do you think is so drastically different between then and now? Well, there are no large saddle shops left like Visalia, Hamleys, Porters, uh, Connolly Brothers in Montana, Miles City Saddlery, some of those. And there's some in Utah, New Mexico, Texas, that would have anywhere from two to a dozen journeyman saddle makers building saddles. And they built them, most of them, four saddles at a time, and they built the saddle complete. Uh, When I worked at Porter's, which was common of a lot of them, we had a sewing machine man that sewed everything. We had a strap man that did the latigos and and billets and flank cinches and such as that. But we built the saddle all the way through ourselves, and we'd work on four at a time, two custom orders, and we'd have an order and build them according to the order. And they needed to be like at Porter's, at Fallis, at uh, um, um, Hal Pierce's. Uh, they had a certain style, and you needed to make them look like that. And so they had catalogs, and they needed to look like what the saddle in the catalog was like. So we all built the saddles as close as we could to the catalog with our little things that we, our little personal things that we did. Hey y'all, I wanna talk to you about the very first sponsor for the Leathercraft Community Podcast Show, and it is Leather Machine Company. If you are looking to upgrade your workshop or to speed up the process on making items, then look no further than Leather Machine Co. They have various sewing machines of multi-purpose needs, along with leather cutting and splitting machines. Check out their website or give them a call for more information. Now, let's go back to the show. Now, do you know how many saddles you've built in your lifetime? Or can you take a guess? I My guess is, I know it's over 2,000, so somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 saddles. That is, <laughs> that's absolutely mind-boggling yeah. to me. Well, like, that is a lifetime of saddle making. Well, when when you did it, I could say this first 15 years before I went in business for myself, when you did it, you're working on four saddles at a time. Uh, some of the times I worked for piecework, which meant... The faster you get them out, the more you can earn. So we put out the saddles as fast as we could, as efficiently as we could. And uh, and but at Porter's they were were much more than other places. They were very pushy about the finish on the saddles. Uh, round horns made the way they wanted them. Straight candles, everything lined, all your lines lined up, and stamping in the tradition of the old Porter saddle makers. Now, what do you see as a difference between a saddle being made by a custom saddle maker versus a production saddle? Do you well, see any big differences? Oh, sure. Production saddles, it's like building a car. They have fellows at different stations and they work on a whole bunch of saddles and they will all cover horns all day long or put the fork covers on all day long or whatever. And all those saddles also most of them are are clicked out to uh, to patterns, and uh, they try to make those fit on the saddle on the saddle tree. That's why a lot of them have poor lines, and they're and they're made very fast. And every every cut uh, in time that they can find, you cut it. You know, it's just it's it's. It's a totally whole, totally different attitude. And most of the fellows never do learn how to actually build a saddle from start to finish. 
because they're so focused on just Both one start, thing. Uh, getting that one job done. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, plus, there's uh, 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 they don't have they don't have a I want to call them almost like a mentor. Some of the places I worked, uh, I was fortunate because they lot of the saddle makers knew Frank because most of them used his stamping tools and he was a very good craftsman and had a lot of uh, uh, admiration for him. So it made it easier for me as opposed to some others because a lot of these guys took me under their wing and uh, showed me some of the things to do. And we built the saddle so the old time way and uh, I was astonished when I went to work for a shop and they were putting them together with barges of cement. Those first uh, several saddle shops that I worked in, there was no barge cement, not even, didn't even have it, didn't even have it in the, in the shop. Wow. So it was a, that was a big change. Yeah. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, so I had, uh, I also, Frank wanted, to, when he started me, he told me they had terms in those days and he said he wanted to make me what they called in those days a short order man, which meant he was going to teach me how to do it. So if so I worked in a shop and somebody come in and they needed a head stall made or they needed a, and the, 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 they came out to you, the foreman came out to you and said, here, I need to have this belt stamped or I need to make you, uh, you need to make a pair of, uh, of uh, taps for somebody or we're going to make a batch of skid boots. He said, you'll be able to do a little bit of everything and you need to learn know how to stamp because uh, good, f and it was not called tooling. It was called stamping then. It was hand carved flower stamping. And he said, you need to be able to stamp good because in a saddle shop in those days, a saddle shop, the top of the line people earned the most in a shop were saddle makers who were also good stampers. That was they were the they were the hierarchy, the best paid. And then it went down the line. But he said, I want you to be able to do everything so that you are necessary in a shop. Gotcha. Now, speaking of shop, I love looking around your shop. I'm there's there's so much to look at here. There is so much. And I just I get carried away. Can you talk to me about one one of your favorite tools or machines that you personally enjoy? Okay. Well, my my favorite tools are two swivel knives. Okay. One of them was one that Frank Eberly made for Louis Ringlero, and it was given to me by Louis's uh, son Mervin just before he died. My other favorite one is a swivel knife that I bought from Ray Hackbarth in 1959 when I went into his shop. And as far as machinery, the machine that I use almost every day, <laughs> strangely, is my splitter. Gotcha. Uh, I, is it the Cobra uh, Class 14? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I wished it was 18. I love it. It would be nice if it was 18, but the 14 does 90% of what I need. And it makes so much difference in a small shop of using up your small pieces for other things. Yep. Uh, I, I make spur straps for, out of them. I make my small cases. There's all kinds of things that I can do because I use the same leather and I can, I can split it to whatever thickness that I like. And it's, it has been the biggest time saver in my, uh, in my, in my shop. Hey everyone, our second sponsor for the Leathercraft Community Podcast Show is none other than the Leather Crafters Journal. Carrying on a tradition of 68 years of publishing the magazine for leather workers and artists worldwide, they also host three trade shows in the United States and one in Europe. Give them a call or visit their website and use the promo code COMMUNITY and you will receive an additional free magazine added to your subscription at no charge. The Leather Crafters Journal truly sets the standard with staying up to date on all things Leathercraft. If it's about leather, it's in the journal. Now, back to our show. So Rocky, do you have any advice that you can give to someone who is potentially wanting to start in uh, the saddle industry or who wants to make saddles and go from there? It's a very difficult question because today there aren't those saddle shops that there were when I started that you can go in and apprentice at. I, I went to work for, for uh, minimum wage. 
and worked for minimum wage until I got to where I was able to earn, and I worked my way up. Uh, so there are saddle-making schools, and they vary greatly in the quality of them, but you need to find somebody that has worked in the trade for a while and find out if you can go in and uh, if if you pay them to spend uh, the time with you and in the process teach you some of the quote unquote rules. When I went to work, there were rules and we didn't question them. This is the way it is done. So that's the way we did it. And it wasn't hard for me because um, my dad being a cowboy, I had already learned cowboy rules. And so I accepted that. And that is a big problem that I see today. Uh, some of the people want to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. And uh, you need to learn the basics. And that means you have to have somebody show you some of these things. There are some good videos out there. And there are some not so good. I, I've watched a couple of them, so, you know, you just have to play it. Um, a lot of people use Al Stolman's books, and you can build a saddle by them. Uh, but it's, it's a very long process doing everything that he tells you to do. Um, and that's, that's the two Two uh, options just about to have is get a book and study a book or see if you can find a saddle maker that you can pay to go in. And what they'll probably do is want you to know how to use a round knife, how to run an edger, and how to hand sew properly. Gotcha. And if you got that down, yeah, and you might even find a fellow that'll let you come in and work on a little bit on the side. The other best thing to do is to get a hold of not production saddles, but old handmade saddles and take them apart and rebuild them using the patterns. That's a very, that's a very good way. And you really need to know the parts and what they are by doing it that way. So you can learn on your own, but it's very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the boat I'm in right now. I'm going to, I'm slowly learning and gradually mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. little pieces of information mm -hmm. and every little class that mm -hmm. I can take mm -hmm. just to start to get That's, to get yeah. just to get my feet and yeah. fingers wet yeah and and you need a person a person can uh, that can uh, do those things that I said can go in and go to work uh, pay a pay a saddle maker and go in and work for two weeks about and you can come out of there with a saddle uh, the trick is is, being able to remember all of the things they said, and that every saddle is different, going to be different. Yep. So you have to be able to figure beyond that. Other thing is, is saddle catalogs. For me, get a hold of some old saddle catalogs. I I have in my collection saddle catalogs from from the 1930s and 1940s, and I, when I was a little kid, I used to study those catalogs out on the ranch at night and sit there and I'd study them. And uh, so that you learn oh, from the old saddles how they're supposed to look and make a saddle that has the balance and the lines and the style yeah. of those older saddles. Not, 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 the, not, not anything prior to probably the uh, early 30s, because that's about the time that things began to evolve and look like similar to what we still ride. What kind of saddles do you like building in your shop or what that you enjoy uh, working on? Full flower stamp saddles. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I, I like that as a saddle maker, and I've got guys that shake their head and said, "Yeah, well, I'd rather build, I'd rather build uh, uh, two or three rough outs to one flower stamp saddle. And I understand that. I like it as, from my perspective, that I've got invested in one saddle, tree, leather, and parts, and I build that 
plane that goes out the door. Yes, I could build a second one in the time it takes me to full flower stamp a saddle. But I also have invested in it all of the materials for the second saddle, where if I flower stamp it, I have invested my labor at which I can, I and I kind of charge from the building the saddle, I try to charge a premium yep. on the flower stamping. So I make more money per hour of labor yep. on one fancy saddle, you know, on through the 70s, 80s, into the early 90s, almost every saddle went out was uh, uh, either full flower or set stamp and flowers, silver with show saddles with silver corners and silver conchos, and that was all markup. All I had to do was put it on the saddle, and I drew the designs and had silversmiths make them, and I would have a saddle that went out in those days that was higher priced than what I get now for a plain saddle. But the percentage that I earned from my work and the markup on the silver was so much higher. So, of course, that's why I like to do that. Plus, it gives me pleasure in looking at something that's pretty. Yeah. And that, to me, they're they're pretty. So that's one of the things I like. And my dad always wrote, my dad wrote flower stamp, Follow stamp saddles and from from some of the some of the great salaries, you know. And yeah. so that that I think affected me too. He he didn't ride a plain saddle. Wonderful. Yeah. Now, besides making a saddle, do you offer any other services like saddle repair? I do saddle repair, I make shaps, I build head stalls, I build parts that go with the saddle, I make breast collars, uh I do also personal things. I make billfolds, purses, portfolios, photo albums, that type of thing, and uh, and then all and other other parts. My wife tells people everything. He, she says he'll make you almost anything out of leather except clothing. <laughs> that's, and that's, we're getting ready to work together and make a riding skirt. Make her a leather riding skirt, which is going to be fun. Yeah, so, yeah, that, that's going to be really interesting you know, to see. So that's. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I I I I do and all repairs. I don't build I don't work on molded trees, the molded plastic trees. They're now gone. They're not making anymore. I don't work on Mexican saddles. I will not allow one of these ones that are coming from China in my shop. And I have to turn down a lot of the production saddles that are being made today because they're not made to repair. Yeah, and if they're not made to start with to be repaired, you run into more work trying to fix them up and all the mistakes on them, yep. and it's not worth it for that. So, so you also teach that I know. I saw I popped in and I saw your classes. Uh, I know you teach at the uh, Southwest Leather uh, Trade yeah. Show here in Prescott. Can you tell the audience about some of the classes that you teach? Oh, over the, the my most popular class has always been teaching the Arizona style stamping, the layout and the uh, and the tools that are used stamping that Arizona style, and uh, that's been my most popular class. I I have done uh, I have uh, I've, I've done another one that I really liked was we did. Belt, belt blank pieces, you know, the, uh, and, and we spent the day and I started out and I went from the first, first one, very simple through to a more ornate one using the same flower. And so people could watch what they were doing and what I showed them. And by the end of the day, you could look at the first one and the fourth one and see the improvement, which is what I'm there for is to try and help people improve their work. And sometimes some of the class formats that I had had early on, because I've been doing this for over 25 years now, early on, I would get to the end of the day and I'd look at, and I've spent the time individually showing people and I get to the end of the day and there would be no improvement and they would come back and there would be no improvement. And it was very frustrating. So I have developed some ways to do it. And I'm very hands-on. I walk around. I take my tools, some of my tools, and say, here, try this and see the difference in what it looks like. And 
and I like to say, and every class for me is different because I don't go in with prepared because I know what we're going to do through the course of the day, but depending on the students, it's how the class goes depending on the students. And so I feel like when they walk out of there, they have gained some helpful information. And that's all I'm there for is to help them with the information to help them do a better job. Yeah, so you mentioned you mentioned uh, that you teach the Arizona style. Can mm-hmm. you explain what Arizona style is? Uh, yes, an Arizona style is very different from what normally is popular now, which is based on the Sheridan style of uh, Billy Gardner and uh, Don King, uh, which are the flowers setting inside of circles. Uh, Arizona style does use some circles, but it is mainly what a compound S in the way that it's laid out. So it is stem, flower, stem, flower, stem, flower. And sometimes they'll flop back on themselves, and sometimes they'll be part of a circle in them, but they're not a group of circles. So you have a you have a more flowing layout that you can see, and the flower is the predominant thing. The flowers are what you see. The secondary leaves that come off of them are the next thing you see. They also always used the same flower. They did not mix flowers in Arizona style. They always used bar grounders. I uh, used uh, checkered checkered bevelers and almost almost always used cross lined uh, pear shaders. The uh, camouflage is an important important tool in Arizona stamping. It was uh, started by uh, Louis Ringlero. Uh, he son told me that. He was having trouble on one particular layout, and by the time he got the fender the way he wanted it and tapped it off to the other side and started to stamp that left side, he had all of these lines that he had drawn on there that he tried to erase, and they wouldn't erase. So after he cut it out, he took his camouflage tool and he ran it up the veins and around each thing to cover up the lines. Yeah. And Bill Porter was the shop foreman, saw him. I like that. Hey, everybody, this is the way we're going to do it in Arizona from now on. So Arizona stamping for many years, the camouflage was the mo- one of the most important tools being used. Well, Rocky, last and final question is, how can people contact you if they want to get a hold of you and ask you questions or anything like that? Uh, okay. Uh, I have an email address. I don't pay a lot of attention to it, but it's lowercase, Rocky. R O C K Y four the number four saddles at gmail dot com. Phone number is four eight zero seven one seven seven eight four four. I live in Paulden, Arizona, just out of Prescott, and uh, people are welcome to call me and and stop by. Perfect, perfect. So, can they stop by your shop if they call ahead of time? Oh, sure. Yeah, people are welcome welcome to stop by. It's just let me know ahead of time. Yep. Uh, my hours are vary because of uh, I don't have a open store. Yeah. My, my shop is at my home and on on acreage with animals. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, Rocky, thank you so much for your time. I deeply appreciate it. And thank you guys for watching another episode of the Leathercraft Community Podcast Show. Take care, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.